Six Tudor Queens Anna of Cleffa, Queen of Secrets, Part 3 Today I want to talk about the fourth book in the series Six Tudor Queens, Anna of Cleffa, The Queen of Secrets by Alison Weir. This video has been broken into three parts. The first and second part of this video review are available on this channel and I will leave a link to them in the description below this video if you wish to watch them. This video will be the fourth in a series covering Alison Weir's six Tudor Queen books and her other historical novels. In the first and second parts of this review, we covered Anna's teenage years, her journey to England, her marriage to King Henry, and her seven months as Queen, then her divorce. We pick up here with this review. Anna is living in quiet retirement when she is disturbed and told that there will be a visit from the king the next day. Anna flies into a frenzy, making everything perfect for his majesty's arrival. When Henry arrives by barge, he is in an expensive mood and much happier than Anna has ever seen him. They enjoy a meal together and Henry compliments Anna on her table and how she has made Richmond into a home. Anna even thinks if Henry had been more like this during their marriage, they would have gotten along better. After the meal, Henry tells Anna privately he has remarried, this time to Catherine Howard, and he is not surprised, but she is a little hurt when Henry makes it blatantly obvious that he and Catherine have slept together. Anna is now under the impression that her body is repellent to Henry, but she has to admit to herself that it is Henry's newfound love that has transformed his mood. After the king has left, Anna's maids cluster around her and they are all convinced the king is going to take Anna back because they accorded so well together. Anna tells them bluntly the king has remarried to try and quiet the gossip, but the women immediately start calling Catherine a little slut and a home wrecker. But you can't really blame them. Anna has to be very stern with her maids, even though she agrees with them, and she reminds them very plainly that Catherine Howard is now their queen and they must show respect, no matter what their private thoughts are. Unfortunately, for the rest of Henry's life, rumours that he will take Anna back stalk her relentlessly. Anna passes the next few months at Richmond, hosting famous courtiers. Anna enjoys playing hostess. Throughout the book, several times it is mentioned Anna enjoys wine and fine food to abundance. However, I do think it is odd that in this book, Anna never mentions anybody complaining that she smells bad or is overweight. As in The Lady Elizabeth and Innocent Traitor, the subject of Anna's weight and smell are brought up more than once. But I do think that is me just being nitpicky over Alison Weir's work, so pay no attention. During this time of waiting and feasting, Anna discovers Otto and his wife Hannah have fallen out, and she is intensely aware of Otto whenever he is around her. She even has to admit to herself that she would like a lover, which shocks her. After an appropriate interval of waiting, Anna goes on progress to visit her new houses, and there is a very touching moment when the Lady Elizabeth visits Anna at Hever and discovers the castle was her mother's family home. The interaction is mirrored in the Lady Elizabeth, which I really liked. It kind of felt like a crossover episode. Anna's progress is not all roses, though, as some of her new tenants she finds oppressive and far too forward. Anna also struggles with her staff, as many of them are infighting over pay rises, and she knows they are spying on her, and reading her letters, and reporting everything to the king. Dealing with people infighting is never fun, but I have no sympathy for Anna when it comes to the spying, as she took the decision to stay in England. And what did she really expect? She is still a foreign princess. Apart from the household quarrels and being horny, Anna is happy enough and does a lot of entertaining. She even hosts the Princess Mary, who describes her new stepmother, Catherine Howard, as greedy, which I thought was an interesting view of Kitty Howard, and not one we got to see in The Tainted Queen. Mary also reveals there are rumours still that Henry will take Anna back. Anna thinks these rumours are ridiculous, but Mary obviously does not. 
after one happy evening entertaining the king, Anna comes across an upset Otto, who unburdens himself to her, telling him how he and his wife Hannah have lost a baby, and how their grief has destroyed their marriage. Overcome with sympathy for Otto and his loss, Anna decides to tell him that he has a son. Otto is delighted at finding out he has a son but also very upset that their teenage fondling led to Anna having to have an illicit pregnancy and give the baby up for adoption, all on her own. They console each other about their failed marriages and not getting to see their son grow up, and then they fall into each other's arms and end up doing the dance that involves no pants right there on the great hall floor. Afterwards, Otto agrees that they should both do everything they can to help Johan and their relationship is rekindled. It is a heartwarming scene, but it is completely fictional, and it stands out like a sore thumb in this highly accurate series. Otto then goes back to Germany to check on Johann. In the interim, Dr. Hast tells Anna that there are still rumors that Henry will take her back, and many people are gossiping that Anna has borne Henry a child. Anna thinks these rumors are scandalous, but is worried that people will actually believe them because they are too close to the truth for comfort. Otto returns from Germany and reports that Johann is very happy and well. They decide together they will wait for him to finish his apprenticeship and then try to maneuver to have him brought to England. Otto's travels to visit their son have brought he and Anna closer together, and they resume their affair with a feverish appetite. Anna is invited to court for Christmas, and even though she is nervous, she comports herself brilliantly and is a huge success. Anna now speaks English rather well, and she has a very merry time, but can't help thinking that if the court had been like this when she was married to Henry, everything would have been very different. Anna enjoys the company of her successor, Catherine Howard, and doesn't begrudge her anything. Anna is simply happy Catherine makes Henry happy, but she can't help noticing Henry looks older than ever, and thinks that perhaps Catherine is wearing him out. After Christmas, Anna has some big problems. Otto has got her pregnant again, and she is terrified, but thinks it can't be managed as it was managed before. I honestly think Anna is insane for being this reckless. She is as reckless as Catherine Howard ever was if not more so, as Anna has already gone through all of this and knows the pain it will cause. Anna removes herself to one of her houses in the country and pretends to be sick for months, confining herself to one room, but it is all for naught as she gives birth to a dead baby girl. This storyline is fictional and dare I say it a bit ridiculous. I know Alison Weir, based this plotline on some of the gossip from the time about Anna having borne Henry a secret child, but I think it was a bit over the top to try and do the secret pregnancy thing twice in one book. The way this second pregnancy is written also reminds me, very much so, of the secret pregnancy in the Lady Elizabeth. Did anyone else see that similarity? And Dare I say it, I believe the secret pregnancy in the Lady Elizabeth was better written and more believable. Anna goes back to her normal life, but decides not to restart her relationship with Otto as it is too risky. Then all hell breaks loose, as Catherine Howard's affair with Thomas Culpepper comes to light. Anna feels very sorry for Catherine, who has been punished with imprisonment in Zion Abbey and cannot shake the idea that if her own secret was discovered, she would face a far harsher punishment. Then, as the king's marriage is annulled, Anna starts hearing a lot of rumours from different people, including her own ambassador, that the king is planning to take her back, and she sets herself in readiness to become queen again. Then the gossip mill starts whirring and the small council come to question Anna about the rumours now circulating that Anna has borne the king a son. And, the worst of it is, the rumours all started in Anna's own household, with her own maids. This is too close to the truth for comfort, and Anna realises somebody guessed her condition, but simply got the facts muddled. Anna doubles down on the lie to save herself, denying everything, and eventually her maids confess to gossiping and things go back to normal. 
but the scandal has broken any chance of King Henry ever taking her back. Anna is relieved that she will not have to share a bed with Henry again, but also a little hurt that she will never get to be queen again. Anna's life is quiet. She goes to court a few times, and the king tells her he has a new lady love, Catherine Parr, but Anna knows, through hearing it in the gossip mill, that Catherine Parr is a Lutheran, and she is a little disturbed at the idea of the king marrying her, and she knows the Princess Mary feels the same way. Anna is a little hurt that the king insists she attend his sixth wedding, but decides not to let it bother her. Anna is much more upset at the idea of Cleves being at war with the Empire and slowly losing. Her mother's home castle is burnt by the Emperor's forces, and her mother barely escapes with her life. The poor lady dies a few days later of shock. Anna is grief-stricken and wants to help her family and her homeland, but knows she can do nothing because Henry will not go to war on her account. Anna dawns mourning and waits to hear the inevitable news that Cleves has surrendered. Crying to look on the bright side, she realises it could have been much worse and at least her brother is still the Duke. Life goes on quietly enough. Anna restarts her affair with Otto and her household love her. Anna still has problems with some of her tenants though and there is an ongoing saga about cutting down trees which I found as dull as doornails. The book then jumps forward four years to the king's death and Anna's deep sadness at losing him, as he considered Henry a close friend. But more than that, she knows he was her benefactor and protector in England. Anna is now very worried about the spread of Lutheranism in England under the reign of Edward VI. Anna has more pressing problems than religion though. Now that King Henry is dead, her allowance is being paid infrequently, and with inflation, Anna is slowly sinking into debt. The lack of money is now an ongoing problem throughout the rest of the book. It is even an obstacle to Anna marrying Otto now that his wife is dead. Because Otto is not a naturalized Englishman, Anna would lose all her income if she were to marry him. So they continue their affair in secret, and Otto even manages to bring Johann to work in Anna's household as a groom. Though Johann has no idea Anna is his mother, she is simply happy to have her child near her and the man she loves by her side. Anna starts cutting back on her spending and renting out some of her houses, but there still never seems to be enough money. Anna's money problems continue to get worse gradually, and she has to start making cutbacks in her household, which cause massive resentment with her servants. This infighting is very boring to read about, but it continues until the end of the book. Then King Edward dies, and there is the Jane Grey power grab. Anna has never met Jane Grey, but feels very strongly that Princess Mary should be queen. She stays out of the ensuing conflict, and is relieved Mary is victorious and she is very happy to take part in Mary's coronation procession alongside the Lady Elizabeth. Anna knows herself truly back in favour when the new queen grants her £5,000 to help with her money trouble. Anna is not in favour long, however. Even though she was not involved, the web of suspicion clouds her after the Thomas Wyatt rebellion. Anna feels as if she is reliving her divorce all over again as she lives in a constant state of anxiety as she is questioned about the rebellion. The money from the court dries up again, and Anna is sinking back into debt, but at least the questioning has stopped. Anna is happy, enough, but quite poor by royal standards. But then Otto finds a lump in Anna's breast. Anna thinks nothing of it and decides to ignore it, thinking it will go away on its own. At this point, though, the infighting in Anna's household has come to a head, brought about in no small part by Anna's increasing penury. One of Anna's servants has convinced Wilhelm that Otto and two other members of Anna's household are bad influences on her, and Wilhelm has ordered them all back to Cleves. Very upset by the order, Anna can do nothing to stop it, so resigns herself to the idea of Otto leaving, keeping close to the idea that he will be able to return sometime soon. By the time Otto has left, the lump in Anna's breast has grown much larger and very hard and she is forced to seek the help of a doctor, 
but the doctor can do very little apart from soak a rag in urine and place it upon the lump. Not much help there. The lump, of course, grows progressively worse and is constantly painful, black and cankerous. Anna slowly loses her strength until she is unable to leave her bed and it is on her deathbed that she calls for Johan and confesses everything to him, explaining that she is his mother and she loves him dearly. The scene is very touching but a little too short, as Johan hugs her and tells her he loves her and forgives her. Soon after this, Anna passes from this life, imagining Otto holding her in his arms. I give this book 5 out of 10. The beginning of this book is brilliant because you do not see the illicit pregnancy coming and of course Anna's marriage to Henry is extremely interesting reading. But after the divorce, nothing really happens. The infighting between Anna's household is very dull to read about, as is the arguments with her tenants. And Anna's second secret pregnancy is just overkill in my opinion. I understand Alison Weir had to do something to fill the remaining 250 pages after the divorce, but maybe she should have just ended the book there. There is no point trying to make a dull story interesting. This is the end of the Anna of Cleffa Queen of Secrets book review. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment to please the tyrannical YouTube algorithm and subscribe so you won't miss The King's Painter, which is the next video coming out in this Alison Weir series. You can also follow me on Instagram, at Lady Jessica Riddell. Until next time, remember, God send me well to keep!